I will start by introducing our panelists and they're gonna give you a uh, short introduction to themselves as well as um, some of their, the opportunities and things that they see within the plastics processing uh, and processing world uh, that might be useful or hopefully is useful to you as you look at your own careers. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, Dr. Ray Pearson. He is a member of the Material Science and Engineering Department at Lehigh University. Uh, Ray is currently uh, the Professor of Material Science and Engineering, as well as the Director of the Palmer Science and Engineering Graduate Program. Uh, his research include all aspects of processing, deformation, yield, and fracture of polymers. Uh, as well as adhesion and interfacial issues in microsystems packaging. He is an executive board member and vice president of publications for the Society of Plastics Engineers, so SPE, and is a member of the board of directors for SPE's technical interest group on additive manufacturing, Palisades, Mid-Atlantic section, and polymer modifiers and adhesives division. Uh, welcome, Ray, and the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Paul. I, I'm gonna focus my discussion on education. So at Lehigh, we have what's called a distance ed office, which provides opportunities for people in industry to continue their education. And in the Palmer's programs, we have uh, two major options. The first one is designed uh, for people who are not sure where the graduate schools school is for them. And it's also geared towards PhDs that don't have a formal training in polymers. So it's our graduate certificate in polymer science and, and engineering. And it's uh, basically a four core sequence, uh, which will last, uh, which is 12 credits. It, it's fairly, uh, I would say fairly short, but I think it gives you a, a good start. Um, with the People who do not have a graduate degree, we often use it to help them uh, convince themselves that uh, they can handle graduate school and, and uh, encourage them to go on towards a master's degree if they, if they do well, it's, it's really up to them. Um, the master's program, and I should mention that we have over 50 students in our online uh, graduate program. Uh, all over the, the US, as well as the world, we've had students from Australia and, and South Africa. I currently have a student who's in Hawaii, which, which is kind of interesting. She's worried about uh, plastics in the ocean. All right, I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about the curriculum. So, um, as, as far as graduate work at Lehigh and Palmer Science and Engineering, we do require you to have a BS degree in either uh, chemistry, physics, or any branch in engineering. Uh, I've had some people come to me with business degrees wanting to, you know, tell me, well, they've, they've been in, 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 uh, in the plastics industry for a number of years and they could handle all of this math. And I'm going, mm -hmm. It, it, you know, in your, your, your highest math course as an undergraduate was algebra, that, that might be tough. Um, so, so it's good to have a uh, strong uh, background in chemistry. It's hard to talk about polymers if you can't understand chemical structures. Um, our curriculum for the, again, I mentioned for the, the certificate is four courses, three credits each or 12 credits. For the bachelor's degree, you can use those 12 credits towards your 30 credits total for the master's degree, I'm sorry. And, and uh, list of possible courses are, we have uh, of course um, in composite materials, uh, we have a large part of our curriculum goes between characterization, synthesis and processing. So we have uh, courses on mechanics, rheology, um, motion polymers. Our, our polymer processing course is really geared towards um, mold design and injection molding. Um, we have a blends and composites course that's really focused on formulating 
materials. Um, my background is uh, I used to work at GE Plastics years ago in, in a product development group. So uh, have some interest in, in blends as well as composites. Um, we teach a nano composites course. In fact, we, we held a uh, SPE nano composite symposium for 10 years at Lehigh. Um, I haven't held it recently since I've been on the executive board. There's just not enough time. Um, I think I'll stop there and, and uh, let the next speaker go. Okay, great. Thank you, Ray. I will move on and introduce our next panelist. Uh, so what we'll do is I'll, I'll introduce all the panelists and they'll they'll speak and then please as as you go through just go ahead and en enter your questions at any point and we'll we'll do questions uh, afterwards. So next uh, panelist is Christopher Gagliano, and he is a project manager for the Plastics Innovation and Resource Center uh, with Pennsylvania College of Technology and has been there for the last ten years. Uh, in this role, uh, Chris works with clients ranging from entrepreneurs to global corporations uh, to support their research and development and training needs. He is part of the workforce development team responsible for curriculum and computer-based training modules, development in support of plastics apprenticeship programs. Uh, he's a member of the SPE Thermoforming Division and Association of Rotational Molders. With that, I welcome you, Chris. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone out there. Uh, just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, Pennsylvania College of Technology. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I am I'm, uh, the project manager for the Plastics Innovation Resource Center, which is in the workforce development arm of our school. Uh, but uh, our overall motto is uh, future made by hand. Uh, we are uh, uh, known as a hands-on institution uh, located in central Pennsylvania, Williamsport in particular, uh, home of the Little League World Series. Uh, so it gets very busy here in the month of August. Uh, but our school has been in existence for over 100 years and has provided hands-on education to the immediate community and beyond. We currently have roughly 4,200 uh, 4, students enrolled in, the pro in all of our academic programs. Uh, we offer over 100 different degree programs. They range anywhere from nursing, automotive, business, culinary, and of course, plastics, uh, just to name a few. Uh, we were originally founded as a vocational technology school, and, and then it grew into uh, uh, one of the first community colleges located in Pennsylvania. And then since 1989, we we're known as a mission affiliate of Penn State University. And also that same year, our plastics and polymer degree programs were launched. Uh, we are also one of six ABED accredited institutions offering robust plastics uh, programs. We offer two different degrees degree paths for our plastics program, uh, Applied Science, uh, Associates of Applied Science and a Bachelor's of Science. Uh, roughly 85% of the students enrolled uh, are in the bachelor's program. Uh, that is an engineering based program. So when they graduate, they're process engineers uh, and quality, so on and so forth. So uh, it's definitely a, an engineering based uh, um, uh, approach. Um, since we're a hands-on school, our, our primary focus is the hands-on application. So for every lecture hour, we have roughly three hours of, of time spent in the laboratories. Uh, our overall school graduation placement rate is uh, over 96%. However, in the plastics uh, arena, uh, we're 100%. Uh, our issue, and I'm sure all other schools can attest to this, is that uh, there aren't enough uh, graduates to fill the needs uh, of our of the companies searching for those employees. Uh, if we had that magic pill, I'd love to be able to take it and, and have 8,000 kids here on campus just in the plastics area. It just isn't feasible right now, but we're making a, making a difference. Um, 
our average class size is roughly 16 students. So uh, there's a lot of uh, time spent with the instructors to, to give that focused uh, um, attention. Uh, the group that I work for, as mentioned, which is called the Plastics Innovation and Resource Center. And it's a home to premier training and, and project facilities uh, uh, for all major plastics processes. Uh, since 1994, we've offered consulting services, employee training, and applied R&D services to many of our industrial clients. As Paul mentioned in my bio, we work from the, the entrepreneur with, with a, a novel idea to try to bring that to market, choosing the right materials and such, uh, right on to working with the major petrochemical companies on potentially new material development. So. Uh, we offer process development, materials development, product development, uh, technical support services, and material testing and analysis. So a great segue to not break into production schedules for those folks that need to, to prototype, for instance. They can come to our facility and we can uh, uh, accomplish that task for them. We have two centers of excellence, uh, our thermoforming center of excellence and our shell polymers rotational molding center of excellence. And understanding, as I mentioned earlier, recognizing the employment challenges that all companies are facing today, uh, we're trying to address those needs by offering a variety of different training, customized training programs, uh, which in, also include registered apprenticeships, uh, which we have two programs, one for injection molding, the other for extrusion, and always looking towards launching other plastics related uh, apprenticeship programs. Last year alone, despite COVID, uh, we were able to train over 3,000 individuals and uh, work, work for over 100 different companies. That's all I have for now. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. I will introduce our next panelist. Uh, so Dr. Ron Kander is an Associate Provost for Applied Research at Thomas Jefferson University. He's also a founding dean of the Canbar College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce at Jefferson, and is professor in the college's engineering program. Uh, he teaches and does research in the areas of material selection, materials processing, characterization of composite materials, and systems modeling. Uh, Dr. Kander's recent work has focused on an integrated study of the material science, process engineering, product design, supply chain economics, and sustainability of industrial and consumer products made from hemp-derived materials. Uh, he's a member of the Altogether Now PA Hemp Coalition and currently chairs the PA Department of Agriculture's Hemp Steering Committee. Uh, welcome to the panel, Ron. Thanks a lot, Paul. <clears throat> Thanks to our first uh, two speakers. Uh, those were great summaries. Um, so let me give you just a, a, a five minute summary here of what's happening at Jefferson and um, look forward to the questions later on today. So Canbar College of Design, Engineering and Commerce at Thomas Jefferson University is about 900 students. Um, we have a student to faculty ratio of 18 to one. So similar to um, what Chris said, um, relatively small class sizes. We have about 40% graduate students, about 60% undergraduate students in our programs. And the college is very unusual in that I have 28 degree programs in my college. Um, and they are all the design degrees, engineering degrees, and business degrees combined into a single college, which, you know, you might ask why bring all those together in one place. Um, but that really, the why comes from um, our namesake, uh, Maurice Canbar. Uh, Maurice Canbar, that our college is named after, was a serial entrepreneur, well, is a serial entrepreneur and inventor from, graduated from our university in the 1950s. He's 92 years old now, still kicking in Southern California. And um, he, in, in all the products and services that he's designed, he, he says that the key to a real winner product is if it's desirable, feasible, and valuable. And he imagines the design team that comes up with that product. Um, the designer on the team is worrying about the user experience, the user needs, the user pain points, and is focusing on making the product design desirable. Uh, you hope then you have that engineer on the team that takes that concept and says, what are the materials? What are the processes? What are the technologies necessary to reduce that idea to practice? 
to a real product. And then you also hope you have that business professional on the team that says, great, but what's the business model? What's the value proposition that this is going to be a sustainable business? So that desirable, feasible, valuable means you combine the design majors, the engineering majors, and the business majors, and you teach them a common language. So that's what we get to do here, um, which means essentially I get to run a small product design and development firm inside of a university, which is kind of cool. Um, we focus on hands-on product design, product development, prototyping, manufacturing processes, and business models for various products. Um, and the way we do this is um, we try to combine the disciplinary depth of the degrees, and we have all those degrees are nationally accredited, so our engineering degrees are ABET accredited, et cetera, down the line for business and, and design. Um, but we then try to combine that with this transdisciplinary understanding or appreciation. Um, and we do that by bringing our undergraduate and graduate students together on industry engagement projects where we get our industry partners to bring us problems that lead to projects and internships that we can put teams of students on from across the disciplines. And just to sort of rattle off a few of the companies we've worked with recently, uh, Verizon, Under Armour, NASA, Georgia Pacific, Department of Defense, DuPont, Comcast, Epson, QVC, Rubbermaid, Nike, Tenneco, Lockheed Martin, Johnson & Johnson, Target. I mean, so it's a pretty broad range. The point of this is really to balance what I say, information versus experience. And this is, I think, the point I wanted to make today about programs. Um, education now is less about what you know and more about what you can do. So I say that not because the information isn't important, but the information is cheap, right? If you need to remember how to solve a second order differential equation, you can look that up on a YouTube video, right? You don't need to be at the university to get that. But once you've done that, do you know how to use the information in order to solve a problem and apply it to something? So that's the experience piece where you get to practice applying these skills to real problems. So it's it, get jobs in these industries now are less about your transcript, less about like the courses you took and more about your portfolio, the projects you've worked on, the things you've done in the labs, the hands-on things you've done that demonstrate you can actually do things, not just know things. So there's this combination of education and experience now that, that leads to employment, especially in these industries. So our, our focus area, and I'll talk about this more when we get to the Q&A, in, in this context is on what I'd call soft materials, polymers, composites, textiles, biologics, natural materials. Those are the areas that our, our Bruner Materials Characterization Lab, our Jefferson Institute for Bioprocessing, our, our engineering degrees at the undergraduate and graduate level, and even our textiles degrees at the undergraduate and graduate level, which is the heritage of this place, um, all kind of to lead around that idea of mixing education and experience. So that's the, the path forward. We have graduate degree programs that professionals take while working. We also have degree programs at the undergraduate and graduate level that um, people can uh, you know, take a breather from work, come in, work on a work-related problem here, and then bring that back to their job. So again, I'll stop there because I want to keep our, our, our remarks brief and look forward to the Q&A session once all their speakers have had a chance to introduce themselves. Thanks, Paul. All right, thank you, Ron. Our next panelist is Mark Spaulding. So Mark is a fellow in the polyethylene product research and development uh, group within Dow, based in Midland, Michigan. He has performed fundamental research in single screw extrusion, developed methods uh, to measure resin properties that are important to polymer processing, developed numerous techniques to troubleshoot and increase rates of extrusion lines, and develop mathematical models for extrusion simulations. He is a fellow and honored service member of SPE and a current member of the Extrusion Division Board of Directors. He was awarded the Bruce Maddock Award in 2006 for contributions to the industry in single screw extrusion and the SPE Research and Engineering Award in 2019. He's won best paper awards in the SP extrusion and injection molding divisions uh, on several occasions. So welcome, Mark. Then the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, again, Mark Spalding. Um, I'm with Dow, Midland, Michigan. This is not Midland. This is, this is Scotland, um, a, a great place to vacation, but it's not where I live. Um, 
I belong to a group of 20 people and it's comprised of, of mostly engineers of um, uh, every several disciplines and at every level. So we hire uh, bachelor folks, masters and, um, and PhD folks. Our group is there to um, assist with uh, our production issues, to uh, assist with developing new products. There's these folks out there that material science that have these crazy ideas and they dream up of these, these marvelous molecules that they can make on a one and a two gram type of um, uh, level. And it's up to my group to figure out how to make that into you know, millions of pounds a year. And it's, it's not only making it, but you have to make it economically. Uh, it's, it's a real task, uh, it's a chore. It's, it's actually um, a very great challenge there's usually anywhere from uh, three to five of us sometimes working on these projects. The teamwork is great. Um, it's, a, it's a good way for me and other of the senior people to actually mentor um, younger engineers that are coming in. So these younger engineers that are coming in may be trained in polymers, they may be trained in extrusion, but it's, it's another situation where you have to go into a plant and tell somebody what's wrong with their, with their process and to tell them um, how you're gonna fix it. And you, it, it, it takes a little bit of credibility, um, a little bit of finesse in order to do that. But that's what we teach our people. That's, that's what they do um, within our plants. Another service that Dow provides that I think is very unique in uh, the resume manufacturing arena is that my group provides um, assistance to customers that are running our resins. So if, if a customer uh, comes to me and says, oh, um, we just have a, um, a poor mixing problem, our discharge is coming out of our extruder, it's, it's not well mixed, or maybe there's some carbon flex or some uh, degradation that's involved, um, we'll put a group of people um, on a plane, we'll visit the customer, uh, we'll, sometimes we'll take the machine apart, uh, study it, and then provide them with several technical solutions to solve this problem. And of course, it is up to the customer to uh, decide what's the best uh, commercial solution for them. Um, we've been very successful at it. Our, our customer, customers have been very uh, pleased with the service. Um, Right now, I've got three of these that are going on. Uh, one of them is dealing with um, an extruder that's actually running at a rate that's exceeding its melting capacity. For example, if, if you double the speed of, a, of an extruder, you're going to double the solids conveying rate. You're going to double the metering rate, but you only increase the melting rate by about 1.4x. So what happens is, is you, you go faster and faster on the screw speed until you start putting unmelted particles out into the uh, discharge. And when that happens, you'll end up with color streaks in, in whatever you're doing. So if you're running a, a black master batch or a green master batch in a uh, fresh resin, you're gonna see white streaks in the middle of your product. And, um, there's some real tricks to doing that. For example, you could slow this machine down um, and that would fix it because then you bring the, the melting capacity back in line with the other uh, capacities of the machine. But your customer is not gonna like that because he cannot make money at these low rates. So again, our job is to, is to make it so that the customer can, can run our resin at very, very high rates and very um, clean um, discharges. And, and then again, there's about, there's about five of us that, that deal with this kind of problem. Um, I would say with the uh, pandemic, we probably haven't had as much uh, customer calls, but I, I bet you I'm on the phone twice a week with um, a different customer trying to resolve these issues. Um, and I think that's probably a pretty good summary. Paul, I'll turn it back to you. All right, great. Thank you, Mar. 
So again, I'll encourage those uh, online, please add your questions in the Q&A uh, section for our panelists and we will uh, address them as they come in. Um, we do have a couple uh, questions here. So um, I think kind of a, I'll start with maybe Mark and then uh, give the others a, a chance to uh, answer as well. Uh, so there's a question on how, how can I continue my education while continuing to work? For those that might be already working um, and want to further their education or things that might be useful to uh, somebody like you in the industry. Well, I think that really, that question really depends on the, the degree level that the person is at. Um, if you come in with a, uh, a bachelor's degree and you want to pick up a, a master's while working, I think that's the ideal situation. Um, I'm not too sure I would recommend quitting a job to go back and get just a master's. If you quit the job to go back to graduate school, I think it would be better to go um, all the way through to a doctorate. Um, I think that's where the economics sit. Um, we have had a number of folks uh, within Dow that actually picked up a PhD while working at Dow and it, and it really worked out for everybody because in that case, um, the research was actually performed on something uh, that this uh, Dow employee was actually interested in and working on was economically important was also very much of an interest to the professor. It allowed the professor to have access to uh, some equipment that maybe they would never have had access to and allows um, the student to have um, um, access to uh, techniques, a lot of numerical techniques that you know, they would not see at, at Dow. And um, it, it's been a very good um, way of doing it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Ray, any input from you on that one? Can, can you repeat have, it? Oh, go ahead. Def definitely have lots of uh, comments on that one. So uh, I, I actually personally tried the hard way. So I used to work for GE Plastics, took an educational leave and went to grad school. And that was painful. <laughs> so, you know, at GE Plastics, I was a supervisor with uh, two in, sorry, one engineer and two technicians working for me when I went to grad school, I was in charge of the DSC. <laughs> that was about it. Um, so at Lehigh, we have an online master's program and, and it is designed for people who are working in industry. Again, we have about 50, over 50 students in that program. The nice thing about the online, at least the feedback that, that I received is a lot of students like it because they can watch the classes whenever they want. And they can watch them several times if they need to. Um, we had, you know, with the pandemic, some online classes to our undergraduates at Lehigh and they hated online courses. Uh, you know, it, it was different. And I think it might've been the professors. Our, our first reaction to online teaching is, it is overload the students with as much information and and Ron made made the comment is they don't need the information that they need the understanding and, and uh, I think that's what our online program tries to give them. Um, we do have the occasion once in a while where some of those students will go on for a PhD. Um, we don't advertise that, but it's possible. Ron or yeah, Ron or Chris, any comments there? I think that um, I think those are both really good options. What what um, what we just heard about from Lehigh is probably one of the better options available. Um, the only online degree we have really in our case at the graduate level is our MBA, um, which many practicing engineers want while they're working because they plan to move into management. Um, but in, on the technical side, all of our degrees are either on campus or hybrid. Um, those, since we're in Philadelphia, though, those in the region that were within a couple hour drive can, can actually do the hybrid model where the classes can be online, but then the lab experiences are on ground. Um, so they might have to come in, you know, one day a week or on weekends. Um, so that works for folks that are in the region, but it doesn't really work nationally in our case, um, like the online degree at Lehigh does. 
Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, I think for Chris, I did have a follow-up for you then. So you had talked about the apprenticeship program. And so when that's complete, do apprentices receive uh, college credits that can be applied toward other degrees? Absolutely. Uh, as long as the apprenticeship uh, is two years in length. So the way that the apprenticeship uh, programs are constructed is that there's 144 hours of classroom or remote instruction in these cases. Uh, the apprenticeship programs that we offer uh, are, are remote. Uh, so we may have a, a cohort of uh, different employees from, from various companies within one cohort. Our instructor could be in Florida and the apprentices scattered across the country uh, that are attending classes. So 144 hours per year of that instruction and also 2000 hours of on the job training. So applying what they've learned uh, on, the, on the shop floor and they would have an internal journey person or mentor that would be monitoring their process or their progress, excuse me. Uh, so to answer the question, as long as the program is a minimum of two years in length and it is a registered apprenticeship program, then they would uh, have up to 39 credits applied towards an associate's degree that they would receive credit for from uh, participating in that apprenticeship program. So it's a nice segue for some folks, quite honestly, to get into an apprenticeship program. They may not have given a thought to it to further their education and this is a, a bit of a boost uh, to, to get to that, uh, that uh, associate's degree. So it's a real positive step. Perfect, perfect. Um, That's yeah. an amazing yeah. program, Chris. That, that re reminded me of, of something else in our master's program is that we actually have uh, various versions of a master's degree. And, and I should mention, we have more than just polymers, but I'm, I'm here to represent the polymers uh, master's degree. Um, we have a master's of engineering, which can be all classwork. Um, we have a master's of engineering that can be uh, classwork plus an engineering project. So you could have a professor at Lehigh supervise an industrial project for you that is confidential. Um, a lot of companies like that. Uh, then we have our Masters of Science that requires a thesis. Now the thesis is public. So uh, some companies don't like giving away their information. So we try to have our students work on model uh, systems that, that they can publish on and, and not give any secret, trade secrets away. Well, very good. And how, how long would, would a master's degree typically take? To complete. Well, <laughs> uh, our program right now is designed to last about three years and one semester. I know U.S. World and News Reports want ranks online programs based on the percentage of students that graduate in three years or less. Uh, that's a challenge for us. Uh, we're we're addressing it, but we're not quite there yet. It still takes a little bit more than three years for us. And uh, how about uh, Ron or Chris, any comments yeah. on your programs? I guess, Chris, you just mentioned mainly two-year minimum. Yeah. On, and the on-ground programs take anywhere from one year to two years, depending on which degree program it is. Um, typical, typically two years, 18 months to two years. That's if people are, are full-time. Um, and then if the person decides to go part-time and work, of course, it'll spread proportionally. So if they go half time, then it's going to take twice as long. Okay. And college essentially sets the table uh, since we don't offer uh, a graduate degree program here. So we set the table for folks like uh, Lehigh and such that uh, they can continue and get their master's or PhD if they so chose. So. Perfect. So Chris, what types of jobs do graduates typically pursue from your program with the apprenticeship. And maybe Mark, I'll kind of follow up with you as to what you know somebody like Dow would be looking for uh, when considering these types of programs. Mm -hmm. Well, 
one thing with the apprenticeship program is, is the, the participants or the apprentices are already working for that company. The company sponsors that program. And so they're getting beyond, you know, turning this knob and it affects the process and really understanding what, uh, what is going on inside of extruder, for instance, and can apply that, that knowledge. And they get a little more background on polymers and how they behave. Uh, and uh, so it starts connecting all the dots uh, to really uh, promote their, their troubleshooting skills moving forward. Also, as they progress through the apprenticeship program, there's, there's of course, the carrot there that uh, they've increased their skill sets and there would be a, a, a reward from a pay increase, um, possibly promotion. So it really enhances their skills moving forward. So they're, they're not just a, an average uh, uh, machine operator, for instance. They, they, they have all those skills to be a, a highly skilled technician. Uh, uh, operating the equipment and, and moving into potentially, again, furthering their education uh, and taking on an engineering role, for instance. Um, so that uh, really enhances that, that ability moving forward just by using the apprenticeship programs. And of course, we have other, uh, as far as the jobs are concerned, um, uh, for, for graduates, uh, they're getting into process engineering and uh, uh, design, so on and so forth. So a wide variety of, uh, of skill sets. And since we cover all the five major processes, uh, looking at it from the credit standpoint, that um, they're not just pigeonholed in one particular process. They understand all, all the processes as well as the polymers. So it's really transferable into the uh, type of company that they're working for. Great, thanks, Chris. Yeah, Mark, any any comments on from the other side? Sure. Um, well, about maybe 10, 12 years ago, we had a, an individual in a group who was actually world class in um, co extrusion. I don't think anybody could beat this guy. He was just absolutely phenomenal. But he had gone through uh, his education and stopped at a master's degree, and he ended up. Um, going to graduate school in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And even though he lived and worked in Midland, um, he was able to complete a PhD program. And what it did is, is it allowed him uh, and, and everybody else to fully understand what was going on in this process. And um, the, the number of papers that came out and the quality of them were just you know phenomenal. Um, it did raise his um, position to a fellow within the company, and um, it, it was the you know great for him. It was great for Dow. It was also great for for Einhoven. So um, everybody won in that situation. I I, I can also tell you that um, his situation with um, with the university was probably a little bit different than what. Uh, uh, the, the panel has talked about his, his because he was a very, very seasoned uh, and world-class individual, he was given some liberties at, at Eindhoven to get him through uh, quickly. But when he came out, he had just as much of a PhD as, as anybody else that's, you know, it's walking around. So um, there was a lot of flexibility in his program. We also have another individual that's down in Texas at the moment, and he's going through a program at a local university in, in uh, polymer processing, and um, we're going to try it again. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, Chris, uh, Ray had showed some of the classes that, that Lehi offers. What are some some of the classes that are required for, uh, for the plastics and polymer engineering technologists that, that you offer at Penn? Sure. Are they required to take? Well, they would uh, be required to, basically in their first semester, they're just learning the building blocks of everything, particularly in the polymer realm. Uh, so processing survey, plastics and elastomers, uh, the testing lab, uh, so on and so forth. Then they get into sustainable materials and uh, composites and nanocomposites. Uh, and then uh, once they get into the third semester and beyond, that's where we really start focusing on, on some processing skills. So 
they'll have opportunities to work on the extrusion equipment, the blow molding equipment, uh, the tool making side of things, uh, um, as well as thermal forming, injection molding, uh, quality principles. Uh, and then they move into let the latter part of the second uh, uh, half of their, their academic career, getting into more of the polymer synthesis, uh, plastics formulations, uh, advanced processing. Uh, so it's really heavily based on, on the, uh, the application more so. Um, and then finally get into some tooling design, part design, mold flow, those types of things. And uh, uh, all the advanced uh, processing classes. So, excellent, excellent. Um, we do have a question for for Ron. So you mentioned uh, kind of the combination of of science and engineering with with business. So how do you how does how do you and, and Jefferson combine you know traditional training with business for those that might be looking at more of an industry role following the program? Sure, yeah. So what we, what we have at the undergraduate level, a lot of the students graduating with BSs in engineering are looking to go right into industry. Uh, and so we have a core curriculum that requires, no matter what your major is in the college, that you take a course, a series of courses that introduce you to the way problems are solved in the other two sets of disciplines. So if you're an engineer, you have to take design thinking and a business models course, for example. So they're required along the way to have to understand the way they think in the other disciplines. And then the industry projects, as they sign up for them, the teams are transdisciplinary there too. So they end up having to work on these industry projects with students that are in the other disciplines. And that's where they start to understand you know, on a team, when do you step up and take the lead? Because it's what you understand the best. And when do you understand you should be backing off, be a team member, but let somebody else on the team take the lead when it's a business question or a product design question, for example. Uh, so that's one of the ways we do that. And um, it, it really brings the sort of the appreciation of how the team's going to work on a problem um, to the forefront for the students. And then in engineering, um, we have a concentration option. And in that concentration is the ability to do a custom concentration. So many of the students whose plan to go to industry might pair the undergraduate degree with, say, um, something in industrial design or something in the business school or something in industrial engineering to go with their mechanical engineering degree or whatever, so that they can get a more business appreciation for what they're going to do technically. So those are some of the ways that we do it. Okay, okay. Uh, and so how do you balance um, traditional coursework uh, with various pro with those projects? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So um, we, we leave a lot of room in the curriculum for projects to be embedded in courses. So there are many courses in the curriculum where there's a hole basically in the syllabus. And as industry projects come, we insert those into the courses, the right the relevant courses. Um, but also we have a lot of sort of independent study numbers and independent research numbers where a student can sub in a project course for an elective, say, where they can then jump on a project for Tenneco or a project for Johnson & Johnson and work on it for a couple semesters and get technical credit for that as part of their elective package. Um, so we fold the projects in. And then the third way this happens, surprisingly, Students have understood and appreciated that companies want to see this kind of project work on their transcript, on their resume. So a lot of students just sign up to do this work outside of class. Like they'll do it volunteer just to be on a project team so they can list that project on their, on their resume. So a lot of times they just raise their hand and participate. Excellent. Uh, Ray or Chris or Mark, any, any anything um, you guys want to add? I can tell you that um, attending Antec is also a great way to learn. Um, I know that when I come back from a from the Antec conference, I'm I'm just overwhelmed with with ideas that were were um, you know spawned during that that meeting, 
And I'm asking myself, is this right? Is it wrong? Can I make money at it? You know, what's Dow going to think about it? And I may go into the lab and, you know, spend uh, several days uh, playing with something before I even go to the manager to tell them that, you know, I, 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 this is what I learned at Antec. We need, we need to maybe uh, partner with this professor, with this consortium, this group, and we, we need to explore an idea. And, and often with those ideas come out um, uh, papers that, uh, that the individual can present. And believe me, it's, it's a, a really nice way to learn a, a, um, a technology. I'd like to follow up on that comment because um, it used to be, well, we all know that SPE um, offers free membership to students. And it used to be that the students had to be full time to get that SPE membership. And this year, the, the executive board voted to allow part time students to be free SPE members. So it's another way to get involved with SPE while you're in school. And I, and I agree, I think SPE is a great, great place to learn as well. I think if you, if you, if you come into a, a new problem, you, you may not know the answer to it. I may not know the answer to it or the, what the, you know, the direct path to go, but I usually know two people that might know somebody that knows that pathway. And I would say the majority of SBE folks are very um, engaged at helping people get to that level, especially if there's maybe some technology that can be developed between the two and, um, you know, and presented. You know, Mark, yeah, I should jump on in that too, uh, Mark. I think the, the way you said that was really good because one of my biggest frustrations about the disconnect between academia and industry, and I spent seven years at DuPont before I went back to academia, but the way we test students in academia versus the way problems actually get solved in industry is so disconnected. I mean, when I, I always tell my students, when I was at DuPont, not once did my boss walk in my office and say, I have this problem. You have to solve it in an hour. You're not allowed to talk to anybody and you're not allowed to look anything up and you have to do it from memory, right? I mean, everything is done with networks and collaborations. So, you know, that's why I think industry projects are so important for students where they realize that they don't solve these things by looking up a formula in a book and not talking to anybody, that you got to do it by connecting to five or six people who have pieces of the answer that you then put together, right? Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, um, uh, the network that uh, most people have built within SPE via mostly Antec is just, um, um, it, it's very valuable, extremely valuable to the individual and to the company. Yes, we, uh, we typically hire students uh, out of our program that help us participate on the industry related projects. So they get to experience, like you've all said, is having a real project with real expectations, a timeline and a budget that mm -hmm. they all have to adhere to. So if that isn't one way of creating a real life experience, I don't know what does. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, one of the most important things a student learns when you do that is that the best technical solution isn't the best solution. Right. Because it's usually limited by finance or customer need or some right. other obscure variable that does not allow you to do the technically optimum thing. And then that's a hard pill for an engineering student to swallow, right? right. That finance is going to limit them on their technical solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is yeah. plan B? <laughs> yeah, the, the engineer is going to tell you, can we do it? The, the business guy is going to say, should we do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A very good, good, good insight. Good insight. Uh, so actually, Mark, I, I have... One question for you coming from maybe the industry side and then for the rest, uh, you know, with the program. So for, for Mark, if, if somebody's thinking about, should I go back, you know, should I do something to continue on? What would be your advice to them kind of from the, you know, the industry point of view, looking to, to go back to, 
do some additional education. And then kind of for the, for the other three, you know, how would you suggest getting even somebody that's kind of just thinking about it, get started in uh, going about it? Well, I think uh, first thing I would tell an individual to do is, is tell your manager that this is what you would like to do. You want to continue working and you want to increase your, your knowledge and your skill level by picking up a master's or picking up a, a doctorate. And then I would look at, um, I would try and find a professor that is working in the area similar to what your own research is within your company. And what that'll do is it'll speed up the process because um, you may understand the process very well inside the company, but if you understand it fundamentally even better through learning at a, at a university, you're gonna be able to apply that knowledge and take this project to the next level. So everybody wins. Uh, and again, the professor, he usually has access to things that he never would have had access to because of, of the, uh, the big machine that uh, these large companies um, are. Just analytical is, is just phenomenal. The equipment, uh, dissecting samples, um, but that's where I would start. I would look for, for a professor and then maybe contact the school and the professor and, and see if, if they would be willing to um, make an exception to bring you in. And, um, and in, in most of the, our experiences, the professors are pretty eager to do it. Great. Uh, maybe I'll go with uh, Ray first. Yeah, I was going to add that uh, in our program, you know, the, the question I get asked most of the time is, should I go for a master's of engineering, which can be all coursework or the project, or should I go for a master's of science? And if, if you talk to the supervisors at most of these companies, uh, they don't distinguish between the two degrees. So they treat them equally. Um, I advise the students it is, it really depends on their situation. If they're in a, a de development group and they have access to research equipment, then I would encourage them to go for the master's of science degree. If they're sort of in an application group or they're more business oriented, um, they probably don't have access or, or even if they did have access, maybe their company doesn't want them to use that equipment because they're not in their organization. Uh, I encourage them to go for the Masters of Engineering. Um, well, I had one other thought and, and it's, it, it's now skipped, skipped my mind. But those, those were the, the, the two thoughts on, on which that finished. Oh, now I remember my, my thought. The project, so what I do to our students who know they want a master's of science is I ask them to write a white paper, two page white paper. And what I do is I, I play matchmaker. I go to the, we have about 20 plus polymer faculty in different departments at Lehigh. And I find a, a person who has similar research interests and match the student up with the right faculty. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on top of that one too, is um, I'll, I'll answer it in a little different way. I think that the, the most times when a person in industry comes and talks to us about coming back to graduate school, um, they're interested in getting right to the nuts and bolts about what they would be doing, like what courses would I take, what projects would I be on? And I ask them to back up and ask two questions before they ask that what question, because I think they need to understand why they want to come back first because there's a bunch of motivations about why you might want to go back and get an advanced degree. And depending on the answer to the why, it might change what you should do. So I think it, it takes a little bit of introspection to ask yourself, why are you, why do you think you want to come back? Um, and I also think you have to answer the how, because the how question, how do you want to come back in, is, is bigger than just the student, right? It's their company, it's their family, it's how much time they have, it's what, their ages, whether they have kids at home, whether their spouse is working too, whether their company is going to give them some time. So there's so many things that factor into the 
how you should come back and get a degree. And nowadays, especially post COVID, there are so many options about hybrid or online or in person or some that the, the, you ought to ask the, why am I doing this? And how should I do it long before you ask the, what am I going to do question? And as Penn College, we're a little bit earlier in that process of, of their academic career. Uh, we have some that are working that maybe haven't even attended college that are, are interested and we get them here which obviously the past couple of years was difficult to get anyone on campus, but once they're here and they see what they'll be exposed to and get, uh, have an opportunity to, to speak with faculty and, and our group, it really uh, convinces them that this is a path they, they should be taking. And uh, again, that work-life balance comes into play, obviously, um, at cost and the investment from the companies that may be sponsoring their education. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes it's spurred along just by our, our annual workshops that we hold in, in the summer months of just being here for a couple of days and seeing what opportunities are there for, for continued learning, it, it attracts them. And, uh, and we seem to, to see uh, uh, folks sign on as a result of attending those, those programs. So it's all good. Yeah, I think that's all really good, really good advice. Um, so we just have uh, two minutes left. I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'll open it up if, if there's any closing remarks or comments any of you uh, want to make. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we really want to take a minute to also just thank uh, our panelists here for their time this morning. I hope this has been useful. It is being recorded. So uh, those that weren't able to attend will, will have the opportunity to, to watch it back. So with that, I see no more questions. I think uh, we, will, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Take care. Bye, Bye now.